This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. Welcome to the human side of healthcare, Steve Love along with Thomas Miller. And we're going to have a special treat today. We've got uh, DJ Wilson, who's president of Wilson Strategic, and he also does state of reform programs throughout many states. He's worked for three U.S. senators. He's an expert on Medicaid. And we're going to talk to him, obviously, about some of that, but we are going to tie it into the COVID-19 pandemic situation that we're dealing with. And one of the reasons we want to talk to him, he's in Washington State. DJ, welcome to the show. Steve, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, DJ, we look at all our models related to trying to bend the curve. And all the people here in North Texas, to their credit, have done a good job of staying at home, social distancing, good health habits. And as we continue to run the model, We're pushing down that curve, and we think we're at a point now where hopefully we'll be able to handle this increase, which we project will be the end of April or the first part of May. But we want to learn a little bit from you and pick your brain. On January the 15th, roughly three months ago, a plane landed in Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. Unfortunately, on January 15th, that individual had the COVID-19 virus. And then throughout Washington State, pretty quickly, 75 people got infected. Can you go back to around January 15th and walk our listeners through what did Seattle go through? Well, back in those early days, you know, because of the Chinese Lunar New Year, which a lot of folks on the West Coast were attuned to for cultural and uh, trade reasons, there was there was a little bit of apprehension amongst folks who had been to China, who had experienced part of the lockdown, or who had friends and family who, who were in China. So in the early days, back in January, there were some folks in the Seattle area that were that were mindful and starting to pay attention because of those cultural connections to the the virus. But those are still pretty early days. And even folks who were starting to track it, I think we started tracking it uh, in late January and early February, pretty actively at state of reform. Uh, But even amongst those of us who were tracking it, we, it was not clear how acute this was going to be. You know, it was still very academic and theoretical. And so a lot of folks, you know, really were quite dismissive, I think, because this seemed like it was a long ways away. And and when SARS and MERS and some of the other coronavirus experiences of the last two decades, when those had outbreaks, they were mostly isolated outside of the United States. I think others started to see that this could be uh, a real problem. But I don't think anybody would have said in January that today at the middle of April, one third of all coronavirus cases in the world are in the United States. Nobody would have foreseen that it would have taken us three months to get our first 1 million cases, but only 12 days to get the second million cases worldwide. So even though there may have been a sense of what was coming, it was not clear how acute this was going to become. So let me ask you this. When do you think the people in Seattle really said, wow, this is serious. And unfortunately, as you say, maybe we're dismissive. Uh, when do you feel Seattle really took this seriously? I think it really hit the tipping point when you had Washington State's Governor Jay Inslee come out and be unequivocal, both in terms of canceling schools, but also how you got to stay home. He hadn't yet issued his uh uh, stay-at-home order when he first started closing schools in early March, but you know it was it was coming, and it was that political communication I think that was so Im- really imperative. He, you know, he, he implemented the orders, but he was also emphatic in the way he was talking. Moreover, he did he was very smart I think in that he got all of the local leaders 
on board singing from the same script so that people at the county and at the city level and, you know, and other jurisdictions were coordinating with the state. I think that was really probably the exemplary lesson coming out of Washington state. I think you see that in California. I think you don't see it in places like Utah or Arizona or New York. I think you don't see it in Texas, which is clear political communication from the governor and then close coordination with local jurisdictions. As we look at kind of the curve and you look at the surge and then you go down what we refer to the backside of the curve, which you, uh, you know, ahead of us, uh, now you see Washington state coming down the other side of that curve. You don't have as many infections. Do you have any lessons learned or thoughts that you could share with our listeners as we get ready to go through the increased volume here in a couple of weeks? Yeah, you know, I think there are a couple. Some are sort of funny, but but really appropriate. The first is don't trust anybody with a good haircut uh, because if they have a good haircut, they're not paying attention to social distancing. Well, uh, you know, I got I to gotta, I gotta tell you something. My wife cut my hair last weekend. I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> There's- well, there are. There are exceptions. There's always the Floby too. There are a few <laughs> Flobies out there that are left from the 70s. <laughs> so, so that's one lesson. I think the other lesson is uh, make sure you've got to be very intentional about breaking your habits. A lot of our senior citizens, you know, they they will like to go to the stores once or twice a day. You cannot do that. You just cannot do that because many, many people are asymptomatic. We we saw this in New York State, for instance, here just this uh, week that among pregnant women who were in the hospital to deliver, 14% of those women were COVID positive but asymptomatic, uh, meaning they didn't have any signs. So those women are probably being very careful to take care of their babies. And we see that here. People who are asymptomatic are are becoming uh, vectors for this disease. So you can't really sleep on it. The last thing I'd say is, make a point to rebuild the bridges amongst your neighborhood and and on your street so that the senior next door, you know, isn't, isn't falling into depression, which everyone is going to struggle with mental health. So the way we support each other is by reaching out to our seniors, by giving our, our kids on our street, a little room to play and supporting them as we all move through this, not just on the physical health side, but on the mental health side. You know, that's, uh, some good, uh, advice there. In fact, we've had a couple of people on from our hospitals that have dealt with stress management, things to do at home, things that we should focus on. Thinking in terms of you're at home, how are you going to keep your mind alert and at the same time still get some physical exercise? You know, DJ, that's really good advice you've given us. This has been very enlightening as we prepare here in Texas Uh, what's going to be upon us in a couple of weeks or three weeks and we appreciate you giving us uh, the opportunity to talk to you and we want you to stick around for our next segment yeah happy to and you can catch dj wilson's full interview on our podcast we discuss the economic impact the new normal and what it will look like getting things moving again that's the human side of healthcare podcast on all the major podcast players more with Steve Love and DJ Wilson next on the human side of healthcare. This is the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome back to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted that DJ Wilson is still with us. And we're going to ask him a few questions now as we shift more towards public policy. He does a lot of work in many states. You know, DJ, how many states do you do programs with state of reform? We are in nine states now. And of those nine states, can you compare and contrast how they've dealt with COVID-19? Yeah, I think the 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 key figure in every state is firstly the governor and how quickly the governor comes to terms with this and then how clearly the governor communicates on this. I talked about that a little bit last segment. You know, if, if you're slow to adopt stay-at-home measures, 
every day increases the the total number of contagion. One one uh, number I saw was that literally every 24 hour period can lead to a 40 percent increase in contagion. So that's that's an extraordinarily high number. Some states were really on it very early, uh, and governors like Utah, even though they didn't have a lot of folks with COVID in Utah, but they struggled there to uh, build coalitions between local and, and state governments. And you see that clearly in Dallas County with uh, the governor uh, as well. I think in Arizona, similar things where Governor Ducey was slow to engage, but in states like California and in Washington, Governors Newsom and Inslee really, I think, have scored very hard across the partisan divide for how they've been handling this, both in terms of running government, but also in communicating to the populace, which is really important. You know, you work for three United States senators, and I know you had to deal with different situations, but let me ask you this. I know we had SARS. I know we had MERS. I know we had all different kinds of diseases in the past, and we won't go back to the Spanish flu in 1918. But when you worked for the U.S. Senators, have you ever known us to face a situation this critical in your career? You know, the answer is both yes and no. Um, On the no side, I think this is clearly of a scope that we were not prepared for, that I have not seen, I think most of us haven't seen, It's just truly unique. On the other hand, I think if we look back at the other major uh, sort of system level threats uh, in in recent years, the home mortgage crisis was unlike anything anybody had seen either. The September 11th and asymmetric terrorist threat uh, was unlike anything we had really come to terms with. There was the USS Cole and there were some other things that happened in the world, but 9-11 was still a game changer. If you go back into the the recession of the early 90s, the recession of the early 80s, the recession and stagnation of the 70s, all those seem very low-key compared to what we have been experiencing in the last couple decades. And so while we've never seen anything quite like this pandemic, and I don't think that collectively we are, we're not even at the halfway point yet, we're sort of at the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. But we are seeing more and more of these sort of asymmetric uncommon threats at a system level. And that really demands a resiliency at the community, at the institutional, at the individual level that I don't think we've been investing enough in as a, as an American society in the last few decades. Yeah. You, you know, you bring up a good point and you're talking about some of the financial crises. You know, I'm old enough to remember DJ. I'm an old guy. I actually remember as a young boy standing in line at the local fire station to get a sugar cube where they had put the polio vaccine on. And people were so delighted uh, that there was a vaccine that had come into play. Let me switch gears on you just a little bit. Of the states that you mentioned you're in, how many expanded Medicaid and how many didn't? And do you think that's had any impact on COVID-19? So we are in red states and blue states, Alaska, Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and Texas. In each of those nine states, Democrat and Republican, except for one, they have expanded Medicaid. Texas is the only exception of those nine states. Arizona is a red state. Uh, It's expanded uh, Medicaid. Utah is a Alaska. Those are red states. They've expanded Medicaid. And I don't think that there's any question but that uh, those have been beneficial at the system level. Uh, I think they're also beneficial at the individual level, but at a system level, one thing that we're seeing right now is as hospitals are stopping, as they are no longer either allowed or as they are diverting away from elective surgeries where people might have a hip replacement or a knee replacement, insiders like you, Steve, know that those are actually the services that keep the lights on. Those are the things that make hospitals actually work and run. And so we've asked hospitals to reorient themselves to be community centered and full of ICOs and ventilators and ventilators and please hospitals take care of uh, our COVID community. Well, they're doing that and they're suffering in some cases up to 80% revenue decline. I mean, hospitals are really getting hit hard. So in the States where they have Medicaid expanded to include childless adults, those hospitals are more stable and less likely to collapse. In Texas, you've got a series of system level threats from 
COVID to these sort of CM, new rules coming out of the federal administration, and, and then just general changes in, in healthcare where you see a, a range of hospitals going out of business. Rural hospitals are really struggling in Texas. Now urban hospitals are struggling. And one of the things that would help at a system level is to expand Medicaid just to help them keep the lights on. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And, you know, at here at the hospital council, we try to be politically neutral. We try to uh, obviously advocate for what we think is best for the patient. And we've consistently said that we uh, supported Medicaid expansion. And for all the reasons you gave is something that I think we really need to give serious consideration to. One other question that I want to ask you, DJ, just relates to something you touched on, rural hospitals. Urban hospitals we're worried about for all the reasons you gave. We've got some rural hospitals here in the hospital council and throughout Texas, as you know, that really are in a very tough cash bind situation And now with no elective surgeries, as you mentioned, some of these could, depending on how long this lasts, some of these could close. You know, in the last two years, I think we've lost about 17 of our good community rural hospitals in Texas because of financial reasons. We could lose more. Yeah, and I think Texas is acutely sensitive and at risk among not just the states that we cover, but really almost all of the states in the country, those rural hospitals in Texas, because of rules the Trump administration is uh, promoting and, you know, rules that have good reasons uh, and and good considerations and some negative ones, the the Medicaid issue that we've already talked about. uh, The the hospitals in Texas are really on the precipice of collapse. And, you know, this is one of those things that when a pandemic like this hits, uh, it, it strains all range of systems and, and uh, balance sheets. And the canary in the coal mine in the healthcare system is in part those rural hospitals, and particularly in Texas. And I want to just say before we run out of time that we, you've you know mentioned we cover these nine states. And what we often look for is innovation and leadership and dexterity in the ability to meet the needs of community and meet the the demands of the healthcare system. And on our very short list, if I, I put folks like Governor Newsom, I mentioned, I put folks like Clay Jenkins in Dallas, I put folks like Governor Jay Inslee, and I put you and your leadership at the Hospital Council. Among all of our nine states, the work that you've been doing to provide leadership on this and support of both state and local governments is exemplary. And I think the people of uh, North North Texas are, and DFW and just specifically are, are indebted to you, even if they don't know it. Well, thanks for those kind words. You know, speaking of being uh, not Democrat or Republican, it, it still sticks in my mind. You did the state of reform for Texas this year. It was held in Austin. And if I remember correctly, it was like the first week of February, may have been the the last week of January. And one of your keynote speakers was Congressman Michael Burgess, uh, who's here from North Texas. And I remember after he spoke, I was speaking to him and I said, Congressman, what is your biggest concern right now in Washington? And I thought he was going to say the budget or, you know what he said? He said, I'm worried about this coronavirus. Now, he's a physician and he's trained as a physician, but even Congressman Burgess said, I'm worried about this coronavirus. We don't know enough about it. So uh, that's interesting. DJ, we could could go on and on, but it's great having you on the show. Have really enjoyed talking to you and thank you for being with us. Yeah, you bet. Keep up the good work, Steve. And here's just a sample of more that is in our extended podcast interview, where we went on to talk about the new normal. Uh, I don't think we've figured that out yet, but it's going to be both closer to home and the government will probably be much more engaged in our commerce. That full interview is on our podcast, The Human Side of Healthcare, on all the major podcast players. Now, when we come back, let's go over to Fort Worth to Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital. Joseph DeAleon is president of that legacy facility southwest of downtown, and he talks to us about some of their programs and where they are, of course, on COVID-19 preparations. So stay with us. The Human Side of Healthcare from the DFW Hospital Council will be right back after this quick break on 1080 KRLD and radio.com. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. Today, we're going to talk about one of the critical roles that a large hospital plays, especially a large urban hospital. And we couldn't find a better person to talk to than the president of Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital, Fort Worth. It's our pleasure to have Joseph D'Alion with us. Joseph, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to take a few minutes to talk with you about this. You know, when you when you think in terms of hospitals today, and I know a lot of times people see clinics that open in the community, there's still an important and vital role for an acute care hospital in a large urban setting, especially as a regional referral center. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of Texas Health Harris Methodist in Fort Worth? What is it really, really important, as we're seeing uh, particularly today, important function and service and ministry that a, a large hospital, a large acute care hospital like Texas South Harris Methodist uh, Fort Worth plays in the community. It's a privilege to be able to take care of people who need excellent care. And in a time like this, you need a group of trained professionals with the right size and the right scope and the right resources to be able to care for uh, what can turn into a critically ill patient. Luckily for us so far today, uh, the uh, volumes in that category have been uh, minimal, but we have been taking this time, Steve, to prepare for you know a surge of patients that we would uh, uh, need to care for. So Texas South Harris Methodist Hospital is a 710-bed uh, hospital. It's been around since 1930. didn't start out that size. It was originally 100 beds and obviously has expanded throughout the years. Uh, this hospital in particular, as a uh, part of Texas Health Resources, one of the three flagships, I'd say Texas Health Dallas, Texas Health Plano, for those areas, uh, those communities serve as a similar hub uh, for Texas Health Resources as well. But this hospital in Fort Worth, uh, we're a, a major acute care, as you said, regional referral center, uh, doing a lot of everything from uh, delivering babies, taking care of babies that are critical, that need critical care, cardiac care, transplant care, trauma care, lots of strokes, and, and lots of uh, advanced uh, surgery. So we uh, have a role to play, uh, Steve, that is for uh, the sick care, for the acute care, whether that is uh, an injury or disease. This place is uh, well enabled and established to take care of, of uh, a wide variety of, of sick care patients, as well as uh, patients who might be enjoying or families who might be enjoying a new addition to their families as well. You know, top of mind today is how is your hospital prepared to deal in Fort Worth, Tarrant County, and the outlying counties with COVID-19 patients? It's a great, uh, thank you for asking me. Obviously, that's uh, front and center to everybody right now. And so in this 700 uh, bed hospital, what we've done is begin to prepare all of our capabilities. And that's human resources, human capabilities, technological capabilities, and facilities uh, to ensure that we have maximum capacity available uh, for patients who might need that care. Of course, uh, as every other hospital in, in, the, in our community and across the country, we're already starting to see patients uh, that we're caring for, both in an, in an intensive care setting and just in a normal uh, medical surgical uh, location. And so uh, we have begun to uh, not only prepare our physical plant and our facilities for patients, a surge of patients that we might need to uh, accommodate, but we've also begun to align our staffing all across the system, all across THR, all across this hospital, all across the Fort Worth community to uh, make sure that we have staff that are both uh, uh, skilled uh, and are prepared with the uh, resources they need to take care of patients. I would tell you that we, we are absolutely uh, ready. Uh, the communities that we all serve should be confident uh, that we're going to be able to take care of them, of their, uh, their families and their neighbors, uh, should they uh, have to uh, be admitted into a hospital for, for COVID uh, and really any other infection or disease or injury. Uh, but particularly for COVID-19, we are preparing 
uh, respirators, uh, ventilators. We are, are preparing uh, appropriately uh, ventilated uh, rooms. Uh, we are preparing, uh, again, like I mentioned, staff to have uh, the skill set that they need uh, and the processes that they need to be able to take care of patients who uh, are continuing to come to our doors all across DHR. Hi, Joseph. Thomas Miller here. Do you have any touching stories from the front lines of the treatment of this that come to mind that your team may have been involved in? Our first unit that we turned into our quotation, the COVID unit, was one of our ICUs. This ICU, uh, sort of the catch-all, it's not surgical, it's not trauma, it's not uh, neuro, it's sort of the catch-all of medical and everything that's kind of left over. Uh, that team had this sprung on them, and uh, there's a picture that's gone viral on social media. So I've gotten about three or four in the last hour texts saying, hey, I've heard that this picture was uh, from, from Harris Hospital, from one of your ICUs. And as I started to, to look at the pictures kind of grainy, I said, well, that, that is one of our ICUs. It's a group of staff members. You can tell doctors, nurses, techs, all standing around in a circle praying and uh it, it just was as a result of having a break after they'd just been slammed with uh, five or six critical patients that they're all having to learn new processes and, and watch out for each other with. I, I don't know that this particular instance happened during that time, but uh, we had a patient that had a cardiac event that uh, everyone that was in the room jumped into action, some of them you know, not having enough time to even put on for personal protective equipment. But that's just their instinct, is to jump in and take care of this patient who needed their care immediately. And then additionally, there have just been an outpouring of people from the community have been sending uh, food primarily, but other just encouraging notes and, and gifts and such. Well, as this story unfolds, there are going to be many more like that. Thank you for sharing those. Steve? You know, when you look at the many services you described, and then you talk about things you have to prepare for, like COVID-19. How does digital and virtual play into the role, especially what you do to serve the community in Fort Worth? THR, Texas Health Resources, and many of the systems in the community, Steve, have at its foundation an electronic medical record. The, elect the electronic health record is just so valuable in being able to readily share uh, information with caregivers so that they can provide the most advanced and readily uh, available care to patients in a way that is, is appropriate to their conditions. And so having that common base of an electronic medical record is the start of that and, and it's the foundation. But as you expand beyond that and you, and you mention things like telehealth, you know, for, for someone who does not need an urgent care setting or an emergent care setting to be able to reach out to a physician or a clinician a provider using a telehealth tool is really just so valuable. I mean, obviously, it avoids you having to travel. It avoids you having to be uh, mixed in with uh, potentially other infected or, or contagious uh, people, whether they're caregivers or, or other patients. It provides a much more a safe setting for you to, you to be able to be treated. So that really gives us an extension. It gives us a way to be much more cost effective and efficient with our time and resources. And so Texas Health uh, and, and many others across our community and our country are, are you starting to utilize these tools in a way that's really going to provide better care uh, and more cost effective care for everyone. You know, Joseph, when you look at a large regional referral center like you are, how do you improve the consumer experience. So even though they come to a large regional urban center, they feel as a consumer pretty much at ease. How do you improve the patient experience? That's a great question. You know, most people don't have to interact with a hospital throughout the course of their lives, in a, in a, or at least uh, in a typical uh, day or year. Uh, we typically see a small population of the, a small percentage of the population in the hospital. So, what Texas Health Resources really is focusing on is how do we reach the consumer? How do we improve their experience when they're not a traditional hospital patient? Uh, how can we uh, help them achieve uh, a partnership uh, with Texas Health Resources uh, for a lifetime of health and well-being? And so what that looks like is reaching out through our digital platforms, uh, 
like you just mentioned, we talked about to remote telehealth treatments, uh, to uh, ways to access health and well-being resources through programs uh, like Blue Zones uh, that address uh, a person's whole uh, health and not just their acute care needs when there's a need to go to a, to a hospital or to a doctor's office. It helps us. Uh, what it does is creates a lens for the patient to access health information through portals, through services in an outpatient uh, or retail type of setting that is going to help them build a healthier life and a healthier lifestyle, which obviously then uh, results in fewer acute care uh, interactions, which is what I think that being a consumer centric organization uh, is all about. And that's not just treating patients when they're sick, but it's, it's providing resources for people to stay uh, healthy so that they don't end up needing uh, services that we provide in our most acute care uh, settings uh, like Texas Health, uh, Fort Worth. And so I think being consumer centric and being health focused uh, is what uh, THR is really spending a lot of time and energy in doing. And I think that's what we all need uh, as citizens and of, of the communities that we live in. Well, we're focused on COVID-19 right now. Heart disease is still a major killer. Last year, Texas Health Harris Methodist received two honorable industry recognitions for their excellence in both stroke and heart attack care. These are some of the highest recognitions U.S. hospitals can achieve. And Joseph DeLeon talks about these in our extended podcast interview on all the major podcast players. Now, when we come back, we're talking with Trish Cunningham of the North Texas Food Bank. She'll bring us up to speed on the greatly increased food needs across North Texas, how we can help, and how they are managing COVID-19. That's next on the Human Side of Healthcare. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare, Steve Love and Thomas Miller. And we're going to talk to you now as we continue some of the discussions around COVID 19, what it's done to people. You know, the name of this show is the human side of healthcare. And we're going to talk today to a special guest. We're delighted that we've got Tricia Cunningham with us. Tricia is the president and CEO of the North Texas Food Bank. Tricia, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Steve and Thomas, for having me. You know, COVID-19, we know we're having to deal with on the healthcare side, but you know, this is really having an impact on the economy. It's having an impact on people that really need food. And I saw a statistic where there are many first-time people coming to locations for the North Texas Food Bank that had never really been to the food bank before. Can you expand on that a little bit, Tricia? Sure, absolutely. You know, as we continue to see unemployment basically just, you know, double and triple overnight, uh, more people are finding themselves in need of food. And so one of our, our pantries, which we in our 13 county area that we serve, we have about 250 separate nonprofits that are part of our feeding network that have food pantries. And so they're the primary resource in those communities for people to go and access food on a regular basis. One of them had said that in just one day, that 70% of the people that they helped that day were brand new and had never been to that pantry before. And so these are people that normally are able to make it. They can make it from paycheck to paycheck, but many of them are restaurant workers, hospitality workers. And, you know, if they lose their job, they're able to easily go and find another job. But right now there's no other jobs to be had. You know, the other thing that really impresses me about the North Texas Food Bank, not only do you give food to people, you give good, healthy food to people also. You you really look at the diet when you distribute food to people. And so if they have children, they're getting wholesome meals. 
Absolutely. So we know it's just as important what you put in your body as having something in your body. Because a lot of people on a normal basis who are food insecure, they do have higher instances of health issues like diabetes and high blood pressure. So we don't want to be the cause of more health issues. We want to make sure that the food that we're distributing is healthy and good for the person that's going to be receiving it. So not just about putting food out there, but make sure that we have good food. So uh, right now, uh, we are at about between 91 and 92% of everything that we distribute is is healthy. That's terrific. You know, you mentioned you cover 13 counties, and I know that to have the structure to, to cover that portion of North Texas is really unbelievable. But volunteers, would you say, or do you uh, have an idea of, what percent of your workforce are volunteers? Well, on a normal basis, uh, we would have about 41,000 volunteers that would come through every year. Uh, and so those are people that would come in and primarily pack um kits or boxes or sort food down in our volunteer center area. However, whenever COVID hit, uh, we were seeing many of these groups that had to cancel because their employers were saying, we don't want you in these large group settings and we don't want you to be at risk here. So our stream of volunteers was very limited at that time. So for the first couple of weeks that we were in this situation, we were able to put in place a, a very innovative solution. So our board chair worked with an organization called Shift Smart, which provides shift opportunities for workers and the Communities Foundation of Texas who helped fund this initiative called Get Shift Done. And the North Texas Food Bank was the primary beneficiary of that. So they would basically work with the hospitality industry, restaurant workers uh, who were had lost their jobs and were able to assign them to come here for their shift and then they paid them basically to work in our warehouse. Well, not our warehouse, but our volunteer center. And so that was great. And then we had also at the same time put in a request to the National Guard for help because we knew that the situation was going to continue to escalate. So at the beginning of last week, we actually had to pivot because we got our National Guard request approved. And so now we have about 262 National Guard members who are here on a daily basis for 30 days to be able to help us to run our warehouse, our trucks. We had to change our shift structure just to protect and have some business conti- continuity. Uh, so we ha- we're running three shifts. So we're 24 hours a day now in our warehouse. We have some drivers. In addition to doing a lot of the distributions that we're doing on sites where there may not be pantries or where there's areas of high need. So these are some of our mobile distributions where we've just seen a huge, huge increase in demand as well. You know, with all the good work that you're doing in the community, with what's going on and people unemployed, donations are down, what is your biggest need? As our listeners listen to you and the good work you do, what can you appeal to them as your biggest need currently? Right now, the main issue we have is access to food because we are distributing more food out the door than we're able to bring in right now. And the best way for us to be able to access food is for us to work directly with some of the the suppliers and the manufacturers and, and food growers where we can access that in bulk because we're kidding boxes right now that have very specific items. And as you said, nutritionally balanced, we work with our nutritionists Uh, to make sure that it's nutritionally balanced in the food that we have and the same thing on the produce and we have to have hearty produce that will that will last for a while so we it's better for us right now to go out and purchase that product and procure that product because we also know that consumers really don't want to go out and go to the grocery store and do canned food drives uh, for us but we're we're literally bringing in truckloads of product so we need funds in order to be able to do that. So that's what we're using the funds that we have coming in right now because we can typically purchase those products a lot less expensive than um, the general consumer can anyway. So funds are our main thing. So people, if they want to help, they can go to ntfb.org slash give. And we're calling it sort of our Neighbors Helping Neighbors campaign um, just to be able to make sure that we can put food on those tables of those who need it. For the, for the people uh, that really need assistance currently, if they're listening to this show, how do they get assistance 
from your organization? You know, there's people out there that have never had to go to a food pantry and never needed access. And I actually don't believe that we have seen the peak because people are trying to make it off their reserves. But whenever those go away, they're going to need some help. They're going to need to take their money and pay for rent. So for, for those people that have never been to a food pantry before, number one, know that there's no stigma tie, tied to it. Everybody needs a little help every now and then. But you can also go to our website, ntfb.org, and on the very front page, if you just scroll down a little bit, there's a map there, and you can plug in your zip code in that map, and it will show you the food pantries and the hours that they're open right there that is near you in your community. You know, Tricia, we could continue this conversation and all the excellent work that you and your team do for the community. Well, we're running out of time, but let me just say on behalf of the listeners, on behalf of the people that you've helped through the North Texas Food Bank and to the people, as you say, that have never had to ask for help, but probably will over the next few weeks, thank you. And thank you for what you do for our community. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to everyone out there in the community that's supporting us right now as well. We we are extremely grateful. Man, what a show, Thomas. That was great. You know, listen to DJ Wilson. I mean, he's been there. He's been in it in Seattle, and then he knows about policy. Learned so much from him. And Joseph DeAleon talking about what a regional medical center does and what it means to the community. And then to close it out with Tricia Cunningham, You know, I just worry about kids that aren't getting food to eat and now adults, people that have lost their jobs. What a tremendous mission the North Texas Food Bank is doing for this community. It's just unbelievable. And this community is doing so well fighting this virus together. And we'll be back with more on this from Latest Updates, Stephen Love, next week. Catch us on the podcast. It's on all the major podcast players. Please stay in, stay safe, stay strong. And we'll see you again next week on the human side of healthcare.